organic farming is steadily increasing. That's good. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Le climat-wandel erfasst immer weitere Teile der Welt. Farmers help us bring nature back and preserve biodiversity. Ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. Hello. Hello. I'm here for the Agri Food Days. Where do I need to go? So you have to pass through security and then you go on the second floor. Great, thank you. This year, for the holiday season, we're taking you on a trip forward in time. Our destination, 2040. And our question, what will our farming systems look like when we get there? This is the subject of the first edition of the EU Agri-Food Days. They took place from the 5th to the 8th of December in Brussels, and Food for Europe visited during the three days open to the public, armed, as always, with a microphone. The aim of the event is to outline a shared vision for a more sustainable future, and to reflect together on how to achieve it. Well, I admit I didn't expect much from it, given the challenges facing agriculture and rural development in Europe are so pressing. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, farmers giving up their vocation on the land, rising prices, changes in consumer tastes. And then there's an ever-growing world population. There should be 10 billion of us on Earth by 2050. So I sat down in the conference room and then I listened. And I hope you will. Welcome to the 38th episode of Food for Europe. My name is Aminda Lee. I'm a British Italian. The Alcide de Gasperi room is packed. The mood inside, serious. And right at the start, on the giant screen, the recorded message of the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, sets the tone. The entire agri-food sector bears the brunt of the climate crisis. We all know we need to adapt faster to protect our food production from a more unpredictable and volatile environment. We have to find a new consensus on the future of agriculture and our food system. Now is the time to come together. That's why I announced a strategic dialogue in my State of the Union. And the whole industry has been anticipating how that dialogue will develop. We are formally launching this dialogue in January. I will invite a group of stakeholders building on the extraordinary diversity of the agri-sector itself. For Peter Middendorp, president of SEJA, the European Council of Young Farmers, it's something he's been waiting for since the initiative was trailed in the State of the Union address back in September. And so I took him aside during a coffee break to hear what he has to say. We really want to go into deep content-wise and solution-wise to try to discover where are the hiccups in the value chain mm -hmm. and why isn't the sustainable transition working in financial sense so far. This 23-year-old Dutchman recently joined his family's arable farming business after a bachelor's degree in international relations and a master's in agricultural economics. What drove me to farming is really the entrepreneurial aspects of it. Plan for the future of your farm, seeing which challenges are, are, are coming at us, uh, how the world outside is developing. Moreover, being outside the uh, majority of the day is something I find very uh, relaxing. And uh, the fact that every step you take is also for yourself. But his enthusiasm for making his own life from farming is somewhat at odds with the aspirations of most others his age. 10% of European farmers are below the age of 40, which is incredibly low. 50% is above the age of 55, so meaning that they will be out of business in approximately 20 years or less. Indeed, I find that very worrying. It's because of a multiple reasons, I think, more the accumulation of the challenges we have, much more 
droughts, much more problems with water management, floods, uh, but also new diseases and markets are becoming more volatile. Um, this combination of things makes it for young farmers very complicated to still be able to take over a farm, especially when you have to buy land, which is immensely expensive. When it comes to access to finance, young farmers are three to four times more likely to get their loan rejected by the banks. Peter would have liked the new common agricultural policy to have been even more supportive of young farmers to help stimulate generational renewal in agriculture. Only 3% of the budget of the CEP was focused on young farmers. This was 1% more than the last seven years. I think it still doesn't really add up to the structural problems young farmers are facing. Young farmers are the next generation of farmers and are the ones who uh, should benefit the most from this cap. Peter accepts that the transition to more sustainable agri-food systems is essential, but he wants to see the cost of that transition shared equitably. In the strategic dialogue, we really hope that the core question is how are we going to make sure that for uh, sustainable production, we also get additional uh, value. Um, this has to be done with both retailers, processors, but also consumers because they all have to play their fair share in this transition. A farmer alone cannot become sustainable. When I hear the word consumer, I feel part of the conversation. After all, we're all consumers. But what is our role here? Perhaps the next speaker will be able to give me some answers. Uh, we have Isabel Busca. Isabel Busca heads the Brussels Liaison Office of the Federation of German Consumer Organizations. Isabel, hi. Welcome to Food for Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. What role can we as consumers play in the transition of agriculture and food systems towards greater sustainability? Consumers want to eat healthy and they want to eat sustainably. The hurdle for consumers to play a bigger role um, in the transition in agriculture is that their food preferences and their food choices are heavily shaped by the food environment that they're exposed to. And the food environment consists of pricing practices, of advertising practices, product placement, of course, um, and price signaling. So as long as we don't attack also um, those circumstances, the role that consumers can play in the transition towards a more sustainable agriculture will remain limited. Food products labelled sustainable are generally more expensive. What do you think of these pricing practices? A lot of producers and retailers also put labels on their food to display how great they are doing in terms of climate, in terms of sustainability action. And they do this, of course, because consumers react to this, because they are sensitive and they want to change their food habits. Unfortunately, though, we see that this is more often than not actually greenwashing the product. So consumers are willing to pay a premium also for this, but they need to be sure there is really an action that is following, for instance, that there is actually better animal welfare. And for the moment, this is not the case. At the moment, we would like to see more transparency along the value chain because farmers claim the money doesn't come to them, but the consumers that come and see my organization say they cannot afford their food anymore. And we think competition authorities can help here and that will also help towards securing food security in the long run. What is the position of German consumer organizations on this transition of our food systems towards greater sustainability? We obviously see that sustainability objectives must be achieved. In Germany, there was the Commission on the Future of Agriculture that reported already in 2019 that the cost of perpetuating the currently unsustainable food system and agricultural system actually ends up costing us more 
I was very happy to hear on my panel yesterday that also the food and drinks manufacturers in Europe in their report found that the currently unsustainable system is more expensive than transitioning to a more sustainable system. I think we have a strong overlap here in the perception and this is a good starting point. So if we design a system that is more sustainable, we need to make sure also that the contribution to the costs is taken on by everyone. We cannot envisage a system where the only responsibility to pay for this transition is put as a burden on the consumer. Isabel Busker, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. The end of this interview coincides with the presentation of the report on the medium-term agricultural outlook for the European Union. Hello everyone, welcome back after the break. I the medium term the means up to 2035, in other words, not very far away. The report is presented by its coordinator, Andrea Porcella Chapkovicheva from DG Agri who begins by asking the audience to answer the following question. What factors do you think will affect the future of EU agriculture markets? The audience members respond on their smartphones. Like many others, it seems, I opted for climate change. The climate change is for the moment the, the, the strong factor there. We are acknowledging that climate change is and will remain an expected factor which will impact the EU crop production in the first place. In addition, we might add also the changing availability of some inputs. These two elements together, they could impact negatively the yields, while on the other hand, there could be some more positive aspects which could be linked to implementation of some innovation. The full report is available online, but here are two takeaways. First, sustainable practices mitigate the impact of climate change. Second, new technologies increase the yields from sustainable practices. And in fact, the final day of the Agri-Food Days is dedicated to the digitalization of agriculture with the very first EU Agri-Digital Conference. Next to where the escalators disgorge the many participants, there's a change of scenery. Can you explain to us what you're up to? I'm actually putting on display a model of the Galileo satellite. Half size, this is seven meters across. Seven meters across? This one, yes. The real one is 14 meters. Evangelia Murmura from DG Agri was especially keen on this model for its symbolic significance. We'd really like participants to have this immersive experience at the conference, to understand that we're talking about digitalization and precision agriculture, which are actually based on this type of technology. So when I come back tomorrow, the satellite will be fully assembled? Exactly. Yes, for sure. It's the final day. After a morning full of stories from farmers and breeders who have adopted digital tools, I have an appointment with the head of Precision Technologies for Europe, the Middle East and Africa at the agricultural equipment manufacturer CNH Industrial. I want to hear more about the link between digitalization and sustainable agriculture. So hello to Gianluca Fellegini. Welcome to Food for Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Can you explain to me how new technologies are influencing the agriculture of the future? They're having a strong influence in the way we are going to reach our sustainability targets for the long term. We focus mainly in three main areas. Propulsion systems with alternative propulsions, artificial intelligence, meaning autonomy and automation, as well as on the digital platform and the data management. These three areas are going to help us to uh, reduce the CO2 footprint from an emission standpoint, as much as work on our overall greenhouse emission contribution from an agricultural industry standpoint by optimizing the inputs and making sure that we can uh, reduce the use of uh, pests and fertilizers. What are the latest innovations available to farmers? 
most of the latest innovations are related to autonomy and automation. So they all go into the direction of making the best use of data uh, the customers are producing and, uh, and then processing to make sure that they can optimize their work while they're in the field. So this can go from uh, auto steering solutions, which can uh, ensure a less than a centimeter accuracy. So assisted autonomy, as much as real-time monitoring and real-time application control for sprayers, making sure the customers can get the best uh, use of their inputs through, again, the use of the data that they produce in the past seasons. Are these solutions for everyone or are they limited in terms of knowledge or the size of a farm? We see that in order for farmers to use our equipment in an effective way, training and education is fundamental. We put a lot of effort as an industry on the training. Farmers training uh, as much as a distributor training. You don't need to be a, a large scale farmer to have access to latest technologies. It became very important over the past years to scale the product offering from a technological standpoint, especially in a setting like the European setup with a lot of diversity uh, across countries, that we can allow small and mid-scale customers access to technologies which are scaled up to their needs. So this is very critical because it brings financial sustainability to them. It, it helps them to get access to the technologies. It helps them see the value, the return on the investment of the products, test them by themselves and not just being told by somebody else. Gianluca Fellagini, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are now coming to the uh, final conclusions. The discussions today were extremely rich. On stage, um, Catherine Gélin Laniel, Director of Strategy and Policy Analysis at DG Agri, takes stock of the three days of frank discussions. And now she's come to talk to us. Welcome, Catherine, to Food for Europe. To start with, did this day dedicated to the digitalization of agriculture and the rural world live up to expectations? We've observed that in this sector, digitalization is um, uh, happening and is happening quite fast. So we, we wanted to showcase uh, the success, what's happening and how it can help uh, to deliver more sustainable and resilient uh, farming system. And we had fantastic examples. So from that perspective, this is very successful. We also heard from some farmers and other key players that there are risks and vulnerabilities. So that's important also so that we are aware of that and that we mitigate this risk. I'm here in particular thinking about, you know, data protection, when I share my data, who is going to use that, for what purpose, and so on and so forth. So basically here, for policymakers, this is important to hear both uh, the uh, opportunities as well as the possible threats or risk and, uh, of course, mitigate them. Data Act and Data Governance Act, for example, is helping to make sure that the farmers will keep control on their own data. I got the impression, listening to the debates and the exchanges with the audience, that there were two camps for farmers, those embracing digital tools and those more reluctant. How can we avoid the emergence of a new type of digital divide between these two groups? I think it's important to say that with events like this, we are both showcasing, you know, the success stories in this area, as well as listening to the concern that some farmers have, and then identify as policymakers how we can bridge the gap between those who have already embraced this innovation and are using that, as well as the ones who are reluctant or resistant. So that means, first of all, regulating when it's appropriate. Second, when it comes to capacity building, we can, with the tools that we have in the common agriculture policy also, transfer knowledge uh, and give advice uh, to farmers. I think that there is also a gap linked to the fact that you have an aging population and sometimes, you know, older people are more resistant to this kind of change. We don't want to impose digitalization. It's not about that. This is a fantastic tool and opportunity. Of course, it needs to serve the need of the farmers. So uh, this is there and we think that it can bring a lot of added value and benefit to our farmers. During these past three days, some 60 speakers have debated on stage in front of no less than 700 people in the room and more than 3,000 remotely because the event has been streamed 
online. What will you take away from it? I was very much impressed by the fact that there is a shared vision uh, on the need to step up our efforts to transform our food system and in particular our farming system to make uh, them more sustainable and resilient. Then when it comes to how and what is the pace of the transition, there may be different views there, but there is an emergency and we cannot continue business as usual. And the second takeaway is that I felt a spirit of dialogue and people are ready to further engage and discuss because they realize that they cannot do that in isolation. So it's very encouraging for the strategic dialogue that will start at the beginning of next year. The essence of this conference has been for participants to share their vision of European agriculture in 2040. So what's yours? Um, Yeah, I'm not sure I should already answer that question because we are going to have the strategic dialogue next year and I think that this will be uh, the opportunity to engage and uh, have a shared vision of the future of our farming system. But if you ask me to dream right now, I would say that uh, I would like that agriculture becomes climate neutral and uh, circular, um, that it uh, remains highly productive, so with a more positive impact on environment and climate, and uh, that uh, it helps improve the livelihood and the income of our farming community. Finally, during this holiday season, let's think about a New Year's wish or even a resolution. What would you like to see for the stakeholders in our food systems for 2024? I wish all of us fruitful and productive exchange and dialogue between all key stakeholders of the food chain, farmers, food processing industry, retailers, consumers, as well as non-governmental organisation, where we will be able to agree together on a shared vision for our agriculture and our farmers in 2040. Thanks, Catherine gélin laniel and our best seasonal wishes to you. And so I leave the agri-food days with the feeling that, yes, in the face of the climate emergency and other challenges, solutions exist and that in the end the small seeds sown during events like this have a good chance of taking root. I don't know what agriculture and our food systems will look like in 2040, but I know that the food choices I make today, and yours too, will have something to do with it. That's all for this 38th edition of Food for Europe. Thanks to all my guests for their contribution to this podcast. We look forward to your company in 2024 because our next podcast is on Belgian agriculture, reflecting Belgium's assumption of the presidency of the Council of the European Union on the 1st of January. Until then, have a great holiday season and enjoy the best of what European food and drink has to offer. Organic farming is steadily increasing. That's good. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. The climate change affects ever wider parts of the world. Farmers help us bring nature back and preserve biodiversity. Ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. 